At the dawn of the Industrial Revolution in the early 19th century, there's a sudden need for continental transport. From the dawn of man, we had been using ships for transportation, from clipper ships to galleons, and with the introduction of the steam engine, there's plenty of room for new ideas. Many new shipping lines had been established during this time, using sails for power, but this would all change when in 1807, Robert Fulton would put the steam engine in a ship. The first one of these that would cross the Atlantic would be in 1819 with the SS Savannah. It took 27 days to make this gruesome journey, and when it arrived in Liverpool, there wasn't much public attention. Most of the journey was made with sails, and only around three days with steam. On top of that, only 32 people booked for the trip. It was clear that the steam engine was very much worthwhile in including in ships like the Savannah, but the public still didn't trust this new way of transport, and because of this, the steam engine was later removed. Steamships continued to evolve though as time went on, and by the 1830s, it was clear that these ships should be used for transportation across the ocean. In 1833, Royal William managed to cross the Atlantic Ocean using primarily steam impressing much of the public, as well as shipping companies. In 1837, the SS Sirius crossed from Liverpool to New York in 18 days using her boilers the entire way. They were able to do this by creating a system that would clear the salt from the water that was pumped in from the Atlantic. This advancement made travel a lot more efficient. Shortly after this advancement, though, the SS Great Western, designed by the great Isambard Brunel, arrived in New York, traveling at a speed of 8.5 knots. This overtook the Sirius' top speed, and with this was born the Blue Ribbon for speed. In 1839, Samuel Cunard found the Cunard Line, which would become the last known shipping line that still operates today. During this time, migration to the United States was booming, and because of this, many shipbuilders had to go to the drawing board. Ships got bigger to carry more people, and more and more routes to the U.S. were established. The SS Great Eastern, for example, would become the biggest ocean liner for many decades to come, being able to carry around 4,000 passengers for one voyage. As time went on, shipping companies would abandon the paddle wheel in favor of an auxiliary screw propeller, as they did with sails, and in 1845, a major advancement would be established. As the size of ships increased, wooden hulls became fragile. To compensate for this, many shipping lines started to build ships with iron hulls. The first one of these would be the SS Great Britain, being another working at Brunel. The ship was crafted of a full iron hull, and would also be the first ship to be ran with only a screw propeller. The SS Great Britain was a disaster, but it changed the game for all shipping lines. In 1858, the German ship, the Austria, suffered a fire while traveling off the coast of Newfoundland. She sank with a loss of 449 passengers out of the 542 on board. This would become one of the most devastating maritime disasters in history. At the start of the 1860s, two British lines were constantly competing to be the best. The Cunard and White Star lines were these two lines, and constantly tried to one-up each other for the fastest and largest ships. They both, though, had a common competitor with Germany's ships, like the later Kaiser Wilhelm. Ocean liners were evolving fast, with the complete abandonment of sails and the insane increase in size. They started to feel more like floating palaces than the ships during the 1890s, and this was all mainly because of the boom in immigration to America and Australia. At the start of the 1890s and the turn of the century, most shipping lines started to focus a lot on luxury and a feeling of comfort. For one, the interior of ocean liners was starting to become something special, with almost every shipping line having their own style. The RMS Campania of the Cunard line, for example, had masterful interior that became the style that most of their ships would follow. You could also start to see many ships popping up with four funnels, when most of the time, they really only needed two. They would do this because it would make people feel safer and showed more power, which is something that most, if not every shipping line would start to follow. Ocean liners near the turn of the century really did feel distinct from other types of ships, which is something I really can't say for ships before them. Ocean liners like the Oceanic of the White Star Line were ships that were instantly identifiable, and this is when I feel ocean liners started to really feel like ocean liners. It was then, though, that the 19th century became the 20th century, and with it came even more revolution.